Marco Corvi. I think I'll play, try and get into an unusual system to throw the opponent onto their own resources um, soon. So maybe knight c3 here. Uh, knight e5. Okay, knight c2. I think this is actually probably the main line, actually. So much economy for the surprise value. So if the opponent plays knight e4, then d3, um, the knight might have to go back to c5. Um, that's not a big deal, I guess. But can I continue with f4 and g3 here? Um, or is there anything stronger? Um, I think f4 is okay. And um, possibly I can use that e4 score, actually. If I play knight g3, try and kick the bishop now, and try and ma maximize the use of the light squares, particularly e4. So we can play um, okay, knight e4 immediately. Okay. Bishop d2. So I've got a nice position, I think, here, um, but obviously I can't do a Fiancetto, so bishop e2, maybe castles. Um, the position looks okay at the moment. Um, I've had some interesting philo philosophical thoughts in the afternoon um, about um, balancing chess, you know, balancing the amount that people invest in, in learning openings, you know, end game knowledge. Um, the middle game, you know, studying middle games, studying past games, and it all comes together in a chess game. You know, it's like a big test of your overall, you know, understanding of the game. And um, if you if you play like unusual openings, you're kind of throwing the opponent sometimes off balance. If if they spent a lot of time, you know, researching opening theory, um, and you put them into an unusual opening, then they're spending more time on the clock. They're they're on their own resources more. They'll get tired more during the course of the game, the longer the game is, and they're, they're more likely to slip up. Um, so, so maybe in blitz, you know, one, one important idea is to sometimes, you know, surprise the opponent in the opening to get them on their own resources. Anyway, here I, I've got nice light square pressure across this diagonal, but uh, he's obviously got a blockade on me playing f5 ever. But he hasn't blocked c3, so I've got an undermining point for this part of the pawn, pawn chain. So I think I'll just castle here and gradually prepare c3, or may, maybe even c4 to try and get even more control over d5. But so rook d1 first, and then maybe like bishop e1 keeps an eye on this pawn, and bishop f2 puts a little bit of um, pressure on d4. So now I, c I can have a choice of either c3 or c4. But do I want to allow a3? I don't think so. Um, the problem is, if I play a3, then c3 is less attractive, weakening b3 a lot more. But um, it's a price to play, I think, there. So a3. Um, so here, uh, I could actually just build up behind, um, and now, uh, so I've got the option of rook d1, but also I've got the option of c3 now, or c4. Now c4, doesn't like keep keep the threat of c takes d4, so I think I'm going to prefer c3 here. And this bishop's also like pressurizing, so both the bishops are pressurizing on these diagonals at the moment. Um, okay, now I can build up my center with d4, maybe d5 later, to try and uh, blast open this diagonal. Problem is, rook b3 seems a very specific idea, uh, you know, attacking these two pawns. But the a pawn I've just noticed is in pre now, so he's defending that. So there's the potential threat of rook b3. So maybe I'll take time out for bishop d1 here. So also attacking that a pawn again, putting the opponent under a bit more pressure. Um, but how will I follow up? Is the plan like d4, c4, and c and d5? That looks attractive. And also, you know, if the rook moves to, to just defend that measly pawn, maybe rook b1 is also useful, targeting b7. So a lot of these squares will be targeted, as well as this potential breakthrough with c4 and d5 later. So for the moment, um, I can take on a4, it seems, but, you know, then maybe b5, but then bishop b3, I don't know, that seems to, to win a pawn, because d3, I don't know, maybe it's worth nabbing a pawn here. I'm very tempted, actually, because I've got bishop a4 to b3. I think, I think I'll go for that, actually, just nabbing that pawn. Um, so if I can follow up, now, bishop b3, just attacking that rook. Of course, my a3 pawn's weak, but I think he's losing the exchange now, that rook on d5. Uh, okay, so he's got potential, you know, pass pawn, I suppose, with the b pawn, if, if the c pawn wasn't there. But otherwise, it just seems to be the exchange down at the moment. 
for not much compensation. So um, I can slip in maybe e6, but then take cd. I'm not really getting a dangerous pawn, so I think just the queen in reverse, maybe to e1. So h4 is also a target as well. Um, so here, the past pawn potential is emerging. Um, do I want to take on h4? Because then bishop f6 and queen h4 is a vicious dark square attack, I think, building up there. I think I'm going to go for that and just allow this pawn uh, to be munched on c3. So now bishop f6 and now queen h4 seems to be a very quick attack. So king f8, queen h4, it looks to be very dangerous um, to defend that. And I always have rook a2 anyway if, if this pawn um, becomes an issue. So immediately I can threaten um, a mating one with queen h4. Um, so knight e7, queen h8. Well, well here, okay, there's, there's bishop f8 as a defense. So how about rook a2 first? Because how is the bishop um, defended? If he has to give up the c-pawn, that's one major asset down the drain, that, that past c-pawn. So if the bishop moves, there's rook a8. So I'm still reserving queen h8 here. Um, yeah, I think my commentary has been more enthusiastic than usual here. It's amazing what a bit of a bit of a rest does, and um, so there's more energy, I think, you know, to, to, to calculate specific, you know, variations, find find nuances in the position, etc. I think it's it's important to be energetic as as well as um, you know have theories. But um, so rook a, rook a8 does just so it seems to be quite crushing. Um, knight d8, queen h8, bishop f8. Well, I can win the queen, but this c pawn, I suppose, remains a problem. But actually, it's checked, so, so I'll just move the king first, uh, maybe to h2 to avoid c2, c1 being check. So the, there's lots of major threats now. Um, okay, so here, f, the f pawn is a bit vulnerable. Um, Queen h8, king d7. So I wonder if I have to play bishop g5. This this is annoying now. Um, okay, so rook a8, king d7. And there doesn't seem to be too much like specific there. So maybe bishop g5 first, and then trying to coordinate with like rook and queen on the back row. So bishop g5 securing g5. Sorry, f4 first. So hopefully I've still got attacking potential now. Okay, so if I play queen h8 now, with the idea of following up with uh, rook a8, because then I'll be on the light squares as well as the dark squares. So uh, c2 I can just take, queen d3. Um, okay, so now rook a8 threatens queen c8 mate, mating, doesn't it? Or no, the, the king can move, unfortunately. Um, to, to e7, but then maybe you know I just take on f5, or actually queen e8 is also threatened. So bishop takes, maybe queen e8 is mate. So fortunately, I seem still seem to have a raging attack here. So bishop takes g5. There's queen e8 mate. So down to the last 40 seconds, 44 seconds now. Um, knight d8. And there's rook d8, bishop d8, queen d8. Then if king e6, queen e8 is 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 mate. So this looks to be a dire position for black. If if okay, so now okay, um, queen c8 looks as though that's possibly checkmate. It is checkmate. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Let's have a quick look at that. What happened there? So um, so first of all, I, it was a sort of light square strategy for for e4 control, and um, now you know I was just trying to um, increase that intensity on the diagonal. And build up for c3 by protecting d3 first. So the bishop's kind of nice here. Stopping um, a3 because I didn't want to be that pawn to be like on a3. Now I was intending to just double then play c3 to repair this c3, but it was forced now with this rook b5. I noticed a4 is, is weak now. After that d4 pawn was removed, it means a4 was a target. And this bishop d1 was a nice move to stop rook b3, but also threatening to just to munch the pawn, which I took. So now I went the exchange up, and it seemed to be all over it here. I thought this was going to be all over very quickly with bishop f6 and queen h4. But remarkably, um, this check 
seem to cast a different picture on things. Sorry, the king e8 first made, made way for bishop f8 here. And um, maybe, you know, here I missed the straight win then. Queen h8, bishop f8. Ah, oh, oh, rook a2. Well, it avoids the king being checked. Uh, so when the king went to h2, then f4 was a more exploitable weakness because it would be with check if the queen ever went away from f4. So the problem started here. I think queen h8 was more accurate. Bishop f8, then rook a2. And then, you know, is black going to sack the c-pawn? But, you know, with that pin, there's no checks. So by laying this check, so this pawn became more significant now for tying down my queen to f4. So a little slip up, not playing the check immediately. So I'm having to take a move now to defend f4. Thanks very much. Please leave any comments on YouTube.